Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Universe Within podcast. Uh, Today, I sat down with my friend and colleague, Sean Chitty. Um, Sean is a psychologist who does work with uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, He runs uh, plant medicine workshops. I've worked with him in the past. Um, And he does a lot of uh, integration work, um, kind of the the, the follow-up work when people come down and work with plant medicine. So um, I have a lot of respect for Sean. He's a great guy. He's a good friend. Um, And uh, uh, a lot of people have been asking me about uh, more information about integration. Uh, So I thought, who better to bring on than Sean? Uh, It also helps that he's my next door neighbor right now. Uh, So it was a, it was a, relatively easy guy to bring on. But um, I have a lot of respect for Sean. Uh, I think you guys will learn uh, a lot from talking to him. He has a lot of integrity. I think he's a really good ambassador to kind of bridging these worlds of of psychotherapy and plant medicine. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. Um, As always, whatever format you're listening on, if you can hit subscribe and any questions or comments, uh, leave them in the, the comments section or feel free to send an email. Thank you guys. Enjoy the show. Man, well, it's good to see you. So, uh, I guess we started working together at the temple, yeah. Yeah, end of two thousand fifteen. I okay. arrived with Caro. Okay, that's yeah. when it all began down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> so, one thing I was pretty impressed is, I find a lot of times with with plant work, there's there's a lot of people who kind of have their own methodology and they're bringing something to it and kind of trying to change it. So, a lot of times, I'm a little like kind of skeptical when people come in and try it out their own thing. But I found the the way you you worked, because you, you did a, a workshop, I think it was called Mindfulness and Meditation. Mindfulness and the Medicine, I called yeah, it. Yeah. Medicine, yeah. Trying to think of something catchy. To... Yeah. <laughs> but I, I found it, it, it worked really well with plant work. I mean, it really complemented it, because it seemed like it was taking it from a much more kind of observational, internal kind of seeing what's arising and, and to me that really seems like it works well with the medicine so um maybe what's what's kind of your background because that's actually something I, i've yeah. never really talked to you much i know you're you're a psychologist yeah so i trained in australia as a psychologist and that's where i started working in you know a sort of therapeutic capacity um but even before that and alongside that i'd been practicing this what i call generically healing meditation which I'm now putting under the banner of mindfulness just because people know mm-hmm. the banner of mindfulness. But actually, that's what I was really grounded in even before I started working as a psychologist. And that's kind of the essence of what I focus on in these you know, sessions that we've, been, um, we've worked in together, actually, in those, in those retreats, um, which is really about very much a sort of body-centered, so somatic and emotional body sensations and emotions-focused meditation, with a, with a backdrop of a developmental trauma model, so really understanding that, you know, what gets flushed up in our lives and, of course, in, in ayahuasca ceremony has um, its origins in experiences in the past going back potentially a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that model, it even included things which were um, intergenerational as well. Um, and certainly for me, when I started working with the ayahuasca and other plant medicine, which was about... 2011 it was very grounding for me so I think you know you, that's a big part of what informs the way that I offer it and work with other people is that I've been going through my own processes with it for well quite a few years before I even mm-hmm. started working with ayahuasca and then within the ayahuasca context another few years before I started offering it mm-hmm. to other people so I think that's a big part of it. And it's also how I was taught. It was, you know, there's no sort of, um, it's very much like find your own way. Like you offer guidelines and structures, but then people are finding their own way with that so that 
and not being told this is how it should be, but this is how you can navigate whatever's there and then you kind of make your own discoveries within that and I find that works really well because then it's, you know, you're empowering people to be confident about their own mm-hmm. observations within themselves and you're essentially just confirming and supporting them in, in the, the points they get stuck within that. Yeah. yeah. But so so your your background, you trained as a, a psychologist or yeah, a psychiatrist? In, not a psychiatrist, no, so I'm not a medical doctor. I trained yeah. in Australia as a psychologist and I was working in what you could call generalist psychology. So this is there's a term that they have in the UK called common mental health problems, which means things like depression, anxiety conditions, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked a bit in pain management. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what gave me a very sort of practical bent as well, even within the mindfulness-based work, is that if you're working with people coming with specific problems, they want to feel better. That's their goal, basically. Mm-hmm. They're not interested in necessarily being talking about overly spiritual terms about what's going on or they're not necessarily even thinking about oh I want to become enlightened or something that people might pick up if they learn about those things in a in a more sort of monastic or ashram type setting but it's like I've got this problem I need a solution help me kind of thing so it's very grounded in the practicalities of what people are wanting there so you were working in a like a clinic or yeah essentially what you would call a, a you know like a regular psychology practice so um some of it was in private practice. Uh, some of my work was in like a specialist pain management clinic. So people are specifically being referred by doctors because they had mm-hmm. chronic pain for whatever reason. Um, also, I worked for a while in a um, EAP company, which is um, Employee Assistance Program. So we were a company that supported employees of other companies from some of the banks in Australia, um, the police force, the ambulance service, various companies would employ us to provide support to their employees if they needed it. They basically had a, a phone number they could call, which was outside their own company, so we could provide them with confidential support. But it would be the, the section I worked in was called the um, immediate response team. So basically, if people called in to book an appointment and they sounded distressed or there was something a little off that the uh, booking agents picked up, they would put them straight through to us. So we would talk to them immediately. And, you know, that would involve talking to people who've just been assaulted or just been in some, you know, serious kind of event like that. And mm-hmm. so that was really trauma-focused work, especially in, in that um, department. Then I went over to the UK. Uh, I did some further training there, spe- specifically in cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, um, which anyone who trains in psychology will come across a bit, but this was like a dedicated postgraduate diploma in that so we went into a lot more depth and learned specific protocols for you know different disorders would have a different process you would follow they're all similar but Mm -hmm. there are different focuses depending on what you're dealing with um and then i was working in the national health service the nhs in the uk and again it was common mental health problems um the same kinds of things depression anxiety ptsd panic attacks obsessive compulsive disorder body dysmorphia various these what they term common mental health problems as well as um also chronic pain um people living with chronic incurable illnesses and helping them to sort of adapt to living with that these kind of things so what what got you interested from from more like the traditional uh psychiatry moving into the the cbt well i mean cbt is the most mainstream of psychological oh, it is. practices pretty okay. much it's, it's the in terms of the research that's getting done in psychology a lot of it happens within cognitive uh-huh. behavioral psychotherapy it wasn't so much that i was interested in it so much as the uk was basically offering internships in it where we were essentially paid to do so we got a free postgraduate diploma which was amazing and we were paid to work at the same time so it was a pretty good deal mm-hmm. um and actually to be honest i was somewhat reluctantly going into it because i was far more interested in the meditative approaches mm-hmm. but i'm really glad i did it because it is so practical and so grounded and um really it's one of those things where i know people have all sorts of opinions about cbt out there people are quite dismissive of it sometimes yeah. um they think people some people think it's not very deep but mm-hmm. 
to me, that's actually more reflective of the shallow understanding of it <laughs> rather than it actually not being deep. Um, but yeah, because I was far more interested in the meditative stuff and it being focused on, you know, working with body sensations and emotions, I wasn't that interested in the cognitive stuff. But having learned it, I'm really, really glad I did because actually to understand that and to put it all together yeah. provides a much more complete picture, I find. So how would you, if someone isn't familiar with, with CBT, how would you, mm -hmm. how would you describe that? Uh, essentially, it involves looking at how belief systems moderate emotions, how belief systems are formed in the first place by childhood experiences and traumas um, and significant life events, um, and how they also influence behavior and how behavior influences them. So we look at cycles of the relationship between thinking, feeling, emotions, body sensations and behaviors. And within that pattern, if someone's coming with a problem, we're helping them identify the pattern they're in and ways to move into a better pattern, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what is, what is the main technique you use to do that? It, it's like a form of self-inquiry or? Yeah. In, so within sort of more sort of traditional CBT, people have slightly different emphasis, certainly the way it was presented to us in the UK. Um, they're very focused on identifying the key belief systems involved in things and then using different either self-inquiry processes to really question the belief and what underlies it and how true is it really and challenge it in various ways that allows people to see other possibilities and potentially develop more helpful beliefs about things. Um, and also then uh, there's a, a process called a behavioral experiment, which essentially means going and doing something which really gives you an opportunity and setting it up really, really carefully. So you've made predictions and you're really, really going into detail about what exactly it is you're trying to test mm -hmm. and then going and doing something, typically speaking, a little outside your comfort zone to actually capture information that in your normal day-to-day -day life, you're not able to see. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then obviously it's a very flexible um, system in, in general uh, you can pretty much bolt on anything you want to it because it doesn't have some sort of overarching assumption or spiritual philosophy or cosmology mm -hmm. that means that we want it to go this way and we only want it to go this way. It can go whichever way anyone wants it to. So you, if you, you know, for example, like me, if you have a background in sort of meditative type practices, it's very easy to integrate them and it, it fits nicely and flows well. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah. I remember one time, I, I, I really like uh, Byron Katie, her work. Um, yeah. And I remember mm -hmm. one time you said it, she's essentially doing CBT. How, yeah, she is. What's, what's the, the correlation between that? Well, you know, her, as far as I understand her work, I haven't studied it in any great depth, but obviously I've come across it along the way. Um, it's essentially asking whether things are true or not, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what CBT is focused on too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like is this belief really true and you know if you think about it even any spiritual tradition that's kind of the same thing they're doing as well it's like what is the actual truth aside from my sort of subjective experience right. and how do I line up with that because that's freedom right when there's no argument between me and what actually is then things flow so mm -hmm. yeah so, but Byron Katie's, yeah, there's a very cognitive element to it with the mm -hmm. self-inquiry processes that she does. So it's kind of that idea of, of, of recognizing the difference between a thought that I have and, and mm -hmm. then the, what a lot of us do is, is identifying that that thought is, in essence, who or what I am. Yeah. Yeah, that identification process is core to suffering, really. Mm -hmm. It's like if it, even in, I was talking to our good friend Publia, and he was talking about his experiences in India and the, you know, the Indian yogic traditions, which he studied a lot. And we were talking about this link between even there and CBTs, there's a um, concept of personalization. So in, in, in CBT, one of the things we often do is help people identify um, what we call thinking biases. So the way in which our thoughts are sort of distorted by our own personal assumptions and this mm -hmm. identification process that we're talking about and that the really central aspect of that is personalization which is where we sort of put ourselves in the center of every story in some way that whatever's happening about us we tend to 
relate to it according to how it affects us or what it could mean about us or mm. things like that. I think in uh, Advaita Vedanta, there's this idea of, I think they call it, uh, in, in I guess it's Hindi, but this uh, this idea of neti, neti, mm. not this, not this. Mm-hmm. Was it this thought? No, it's not that. Or with this one? No, not that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind yeah. of through a process of, of letting go of each of those thoughts. Yeah, that's the really esoteric end of it. It's like recognizing that every single thought is n- not it. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's like it is where you're perceiving the thought from, not the thought itself kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah. so what is, you said there's some criticism of CBT. What, what's, yeah. the, what's the main criticism of it? Um, the main criticism is it's got all the funding. <laughs> <laughs> no, the main, the main criticism is, you know, there's out there in psychotherapy and psychology land, there's lots of different practices that emphasize different things. So, you know, you might have the, like say Jungian psychotherapy, which is looking at, you know, the unconscious and the different archetypes and exploring those things. Um, then you might have the somatic practices, somatic experiencing, trauma release exercising, exercises which are focused very much on the physiological element of trauma and how do we work with that. Um, then there's a sort of psychoanalytic stuff, like the Freudian type psychotherapies. And, and some of the people from his even practices look at CBT and say, oh, it's it's shallow somehow. Okay. Um, you know, I'm sure you'd need to ask someone who actually holds that belief for themselves to get a more eloquent explanation of it than me. Um, but really having done the kind of things I've done um, I really don't have that impression anymore I mean I, even someone very famous who shall remain nameless at this point um, said when I started doing this work within the context of the ayahuasca retreats oh no CBT doesn't work well with ayahuasca mm. and I said, based on what research and understanding did they come up with that mm. opinion but the thing is, when I've done it within that context, people say it's awesome. Mm-hmm. So the feedback <laughs> tells me otherwise. And I think, um, you know, it's it's not necessarily just the tool itself, but what you do with it and how you understand it. And if you, um, you know, if you have kind of faith and confidence in, in what you're doing, then I think that comes through in the delivery and, mm-hmm. you know, you just... I think having experience within iOS called myself helps me to understand how to do it with people in a way that is meaningful, not shallow. I mean, I I don't know it. I don't know a lot about kind of the statistics and how things work, but just doing a little bit of research. I mean, it seems like there's kind of a growing momentum of of kind of showing that uh, there, there's there's it seems like some hard data saying to kind of pointing to the uh, efficacy of it uh, to the that, that it really seems to be having, you know, real results. I mean, people do seem to be benefiting from it, from from CBT. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's more data on CBT than there is on any other psychotherapy, full stop, by, mm-hmm. by miles. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of psychotherapies don't do any research at all, mm-hmm. or if they do, it, it, you know, there are challenges and limitations of the research process. Essentially... You know, you sort of got to step into the medical model to define what you're trying to prove. And as far as I know, not ever having been deeply involved in any research myself, um, you really need to be affiliated with a university, ideally, to be able to get the funding, understand the ethics applications process, you know, understand how to write the hypotheses and, and set the... Uh, experimental process up in the right way, have access to research assistance. It's a time-consuming and expensive process. And then to get published as well. So there are sort of processes that make it essentially much easier for someone who's in a university to get it done than someone who's not. And a lot of the psychotherapies out there aren't really based in universities, so it's going to be difficult for them to engage in the research process. So, um, And someone who's already built their career researching CBT is not about to suddenly shoot off into researching some other thing. So for that reason, the, the amount of research on CBT keeps growing and other things don't necessarily. So, mm. yeah. 
it's not the be all and end all by any means, but it's definitely a very useful system. So how did you how did you get interested then in, in plant medicine? Well, <laughs> back in the day, I think as a as a as a teenager, psychedelics just you know were around, and um, especially with the sort of you know electronic music scene and things like that, there was that curiosity, and I started uh, using mushrooms and LSD and things like that in a more recreational hedonistic type <laughs> atmosphere and had a lot of fun with that and it was definitely good for me to you know take the lid off the sort of teen angst and all that mm-hmm. um and I think it's just sort of natural evolution of that I the, sp- the specific trigger was the release of DMT the spirit molecule uh, the documentary of the book mm-hmm. um, and I saw that and that prompted me to start googling ayahuasca and um, I found some retreats nearby where I was then and basically went to them and obviously as we both know <laughs> it's a very compelling experience and after that I mean it just never stopped I went to as many retreats as I could and mm. one thing led to another so there was something in that first retreat that, that shifted something or opened you to something? Yeah, I mean, I think I experienced the death experience like twice in the first night kind of <laughs> thing. Um, I did the Oscar-winning performance, Oscar win, Oscar award-winning performance of dying. Like I was like, <laughs> actually laid myself down to die. It was quite beautiful, um, confronting, obviously, too. And... Yeah, I think you just I just came out of it feeling great and mm-hmm. you know, like many people experience at retreats, the people I met there were really cool and kind of opened up a lot of connections and became a big part of my life. Um yeah, so and then once I was in that scene then I started you know, people we start to find out more and more about different things that are going on, so I started working with peyote as well and um yeah, it did never seemed any question that I would stop. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, th- kind of working with with your background in plant medicine, it just mm-hmm. kind of naturally converged, and you. Yeah, I mean, I think so. So when I came down to the temple with Caro, it was really Caro's initiative to 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 look for that work, um, mm-hmm. and I hadn't really considered that I could do that. Hmm. Um, but she encouraged me to apply with her and we did and we applied together and then when I got to the temple with her um, because of my hearing problem pretty quickly established that with you know like up to five maestros singing at once and all the background noise from the <laughs> from the jungle there was absolutely no way I was going to be able to do the facilitating work that we were initially intending to do and um, it took a little while to sort of figure out what I could do but then essentially we landed on that I might be able to offer these workshops. Um, and so we trialed that a little bit and the feedback was really good and that's what led to the me being able to offer the mindfulness and the medicine mm-hmm. uh, retreats. And But really I hadn't actually planned it at all in advance. It was kind of chance and luck that led to the opening and I guess the rise of integration. So when, you know, Gabor connected to the temple and, and Tanya came, um, that sort of raise the opportunity as well yeah. because it, I mean probably a lot of people know but there's probably a lot of people who don't know too that that in psychology uh, you know psychedelics is kind of a controversial word but yeah. but you know working with something like for example LSD at one point mm-hmm. it was very oh yeah very revolutionary and, were, they and loved it. I mean they did not want to stop all the all the psychotherapists and psychiatrists involved in that knew they were onto something amazing mm-hmm. they did not want to stop I don't. I think some of them didn't. <laughs> they just went underground. Um, but yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing. Why when I was in the UK, I didn't mention too much to to most of the people I was working with about the fact that I had this interest. Um, but when I was leaving the UK to come to Peru, I didn't care anymore because I was leaving. So I told some of my colleagues what I was doing, and they were all really happy and excited for me. And I realised actually, I think there's a you know, despite the fact that it has been taboo. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest in in psychedelics within psychotherapy and psychiatry, um, and 
I even remember talking to a, a psychiatrist, actually, a UK-based psychiatrist, and we were at a San Pedro retreat, and I think he'd just spent the day sitting under a tree talking to the Queen in his mind or something like that about her plans for the United Kingdom and what that <laughs> meant to her, all these funny things that make perfect sense in plant medicine terms but sound a bit wacky to most people. But um, I said to him, what would happen if, if your colleagues found out that you know you were into this stuff and he said it'd be fired on the spot? Wow. So I think there's a lot of people who are interested who just keep their mouths shut for, for mm -hmm. professional reasons. But, you know, people in psychiatry and psychology in general are open-minded about the mind, obviously. So um, anything that's going to help people, of course, they're going to be interested in it. I think it's really just the, the you know, the political climate and, mm -hmm. you know, waiting for the right time for people to out themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but obviously these days it's growing and growing and growing. So Yeah. So why do you think something like, you know, also in this work, there often it's kind of separated between like synthetics and natural medicine. But, oh, yeah. but you know, even LSD as a synthetic, why, why do you think that was such a kind of a powerful tool for psychologists to have? Like, what, what was that doing that really allowed them to, to better their work? There's probably lots of ways to answer that. Um, and so I'm just going to give my subjective perspective on it, really, rather than this is not some sort of massively research-informed <laughs> perspective or anything. Um, I think it's because psychedelics have the capacity to weaken the, what you might term in old school terms, the ego defenses, so the, the parts of us that sort of suppress and control and um, try to protect us from the more painful aspects of our psyche, uh, psychedelics in general seem to have the, the power to weaken and or overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I think, is a really important element of it. I think it's more slightly more research-based, don't want to bastardize this too badly, but I think it's that the, the self-critical aspect of our mind, which I think is some, some part of the frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a therapist and a researcher. <laughs> um, is the activity of that is actually decreased certainly within magic mushrooms, and I assume that probably applies to other um, psychedelics as well. Um, obviously, the psychedelic experience itself allows for novel thinking processes, novel experiencing, which, you know, to give one sort of archetypal example, if you think of something like depression, uh, it correlates most closely with emotions, uh, including hopelessness, which is essentially a sense that nothing's going to help like mm -hmm. this feels terrible and and it's, i don't see a way out and so within a psychedelic experience you tend to see lots of different perspectives become possible so when you're seeing lots of different perspectives an emotion like hopelessness is correlates less with that mm -hmm. because you can see all these different things and so plus this sort of novelty of the experience as well to give you an experience outside your day-to-day mm -hmm. Life can be really reinforcing. Obviously, the transpersonal experiences, especially if people experience kind of elevated states of mind for a while or a sense of liberation from who they thought they were. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be really, really liberating. And also just the fascination, you know, having something to be interested in where you suddenly realize, oh, my God, there's all these worlds within worlds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> out there that I didn't even realize were there before so yeah I think all these factors yeah I mean that's interesting because uh, it seems like a lot of the the current research is showing or pointing to these ideas of, of neurogenesis neuroplasticity which is literally that right like the opening of new possibilities yeah um, even the Shpibo who we both worked with you know they they say often when they're working that's that's like one of the final things they're working on is opening someone up to new possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so why, why do you think there, uh, it seems like in the last 20, 30 years, there's been a, 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 a really a big interest in this. I mean, even like where we've worked, uh, probably 20 years ago, we wouldn't have had a job. I mean, there just wasn't mm -hmm. that much interest in it. But it seems like, you know, so many people are now becoming interested in, in plants as medicine. And, and, you know, a lot of these plant medicines, they, they do alter the psyche to some degree. Do you think it's just because 
that information is getting out there and people have access to it? Or do you think people, there, there's really like a, a need for it more and more in, in, in this age? Or you know, what, do you, what do you see happening? I don't know for sure. Um, maybe the internet, mm-hmm. you know, has, and, and the, you know, the propagation of information through the internet um, has sped things up. Um, I can't say I've never really, you know, done any kind of analysis of it. You know, there were these sort of key moments as well, like, for example, the publication of um, DMT, the spirit molecule, is what prompted me. And I think a lot of people mm-hmm. will converge around events like that, and that will prompt them to start looking for things. Um, you know, that was the first legal psychedelic research that had occurred since the prohibition of the, the research, whenever that was, Nixon era, was it? Mm-hmm. wasn't yeah. even around when yeah. it happened, right? Um, so that opening up must have done a lot of things. I'm sure that, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm just making things up now, but like no. goa yeah. trance, psychedelic <laughs> trance, and the sort of <coughs> the growth of the psychedelic movement around music festivals. Um, but again, that's been around since, in the, in the West anyway, since what, Woodstock in the 60s and 70s. So I don't know. Mm. Um, something happened, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. But even like the, you know, if you think of like, uh, you know, trans parties and stuff, it tends to be more younger people. Yeah. Um, but from my experience, and I'm sure it's the same with you, you know, most of the people coming to do this work, they're maybe more middle aged, middle class, upper upper middle class, you know, yeah. people who have careers, who have, mm-hmm. you know, successful lives, and yet they're they're coming to experience this. Yes, that might also be influenced by socioeconomic factors, <laughs> so that people who can afford to come mm-hmm. and travel and fly, but um because there's a lot of interest in psychedelics and plant medicines within younger people that don't necessarily go to ceremonies and retreats in formal settings mm-hmm. maybe there's an eight in the sort of yeah like when people are teenage and in their 20s they like to just do things for themselves don't they? and then mm-hmm. the older people get them or they're like oh I want a nice settled yeah. location for this and mm-hmm. I don't know but yeah well what are the what are some of I mean because you've run a number of workshops now and, and from my experience because we worked together a number of times they've They've been really successful. I mean, always from my experience, you know, when, when this work is done well and correctly, in general, it's a, it's a success. But, um, you know, you've worked with a lot of people now. So what do you see, what do you see as kind of archetypical reasons that people are coming down? A lot of people won't have just recognized that there's something in their life that's problematic, be it that they've experienced some trauma um, and they've heard that ayahuasca can help them with that, um, that they experience depression or anxiety. Uh, some people, I think, are just hear that it's potentially transformative and recognize that they want to they experience whatever that is. Um, a lot of word-of-mouth recommendations, I think, people have heard from other people's experiences. Um, I think also this sense of people looking for a purpose, mm-hmm. Like they just want to see what is my life really about, mm-hmm. not what I've been taught it's supposed to be about. Um, and, you know, I suspect, you know, I have my pet theories, right? Like they're not research-based necessarily at all, but I suspect that there's a there's something about working with plants and being connected to an earthy kind of process, an earthy tradition, which at some level is like an ancestral memory or a deep yearning or need and something about the, you know, industrialized society, the, you know, economic focused society, which is the West is essentially built around and focused on the economy to a big degree. It's it's lacks, doesn't provide something. And I guess the, the questioning and breakdown of, for many people, their sort of, faith in traditional religions and things like that maybe there's a there's a gap there Mm -hmm. um so i think i I think there's a drive in there Mm -hmm. that people are looking for something both healing as well as inspiration Mm 
So if someone's never worked with, with kind of these plant medicines before, what, what would they expect? Like, what, what would that look like, you know? <laughs> they, they've heard it. They, they've heard it from word of mouth. You know, yeah. their, their best friend told them, oh, you have to go do this. It's amazing. Yeah. It's going to transform your life." And they're like, "Okay, I'm going to go do it." So what? <laughs> what? What are they in for? <laughs> they're in for a ride potentially. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a it's a process of discovery, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And I think they need to be prepared to face difficult aspects of themselves arising. Um, they need to be prepared to face potentially difficult, unknown and unfamiliar things arising. So sometimes people are going to experience a sense of a very introspective process where they are brought face to face with uh, events from the past mm-hmm. and shown how that's affecting them and potentially how they can be freed from that, what they can do about it, if there's things they need to change in their life. So sometimes people's experience is very personal, um, but also then there's these very otherworldly type experiences that people can have where um, perhaps they are going to be shown uh, the plant world, for example, and the, the, the spirituality of the plant world in a way that they've never even considered existed before um, they might have um, experiences of transpersonal um, domains, so experiences beyond the self, where they experience either themselves as no longer having a personhood, um, or perhaps where they experience themselves being altered in some way into, say, like encountering themselves as an animal or um, something other than what they normally. <laughs> consider themselves to be as an ordinary human being. Um, Sometimes they can be very dark experiences, which can be very challenging, so a sense of being confronted by um, quite hellish-looking or alien-looking things, um, you know, beings, if you like. Um, I mean, it's difficult to do it justice because it's so the possibilities are so broad, and so I guess that's the, the... it's hard to tell someone what they should expect. It's almost, in my opinion, better to tell them what they should be prepared to accept, mm. <laughs> which is pretty much anything and everything. Um, it can be very emotional. It can be very physically testing. Like you can feel nauseous. You can feel pains in your body. You can feel very strange, unusual sensations um, and energies in your body. Um, you can experience kind of intrapsychic you know, transpersonal experiences, feeling like you can understand other people's experiences in a psychic kind of a way. Um, I mean, especially working, for example, with the you know, Shapibo maestros, you can potentially experience the fact that someone else can sing energetically to you in a way that it directly affects and guides what then happens in your emotions in your psyche mm-hmm. um, that can be confronting for people to realize that, that that was a very confronting experience for me was the the first time I realized that my mind was not my private domain mm-hmm. which up to that point I pretty much thought it was <laughs> mm-hmm. and the first time I experienced what seemed subjectively as though something was for want of a better word intruding into my psychic space um, and I could actually sort of experience the boundary of what was me and what was not me, but it was all in my psychic experience. That was extremely confronting, actually, because it was like that's a, I think the term they call it is ontological challenge, where your sort of fundamental assumptions about the way the mind works, the way meaning is formed, the way the world works are challenged. Mm. Um, so a lot, a lot of different types of experiences can arise. <laughs> so with, uh, with all of these, you know, diverse possibilities of experience that can arise, why would someone want to do that? What, what's the point of having any, any number of those experiences? I think 
for some people that is the point is, is like to to encounter these diverse experiences and and to learn about different dimensions of possibility within the human experience typically speaking in the west people are coming because they're seeking some form of healing mm-hmm. or inspiration and they've heard that it can provide that and it seems to be able to do that so by confronting different memories and emotions and body sensations and sort of stored energy in the body, if you like, things can shift and move in a way that seems to typically um, condition upon it being done well, as we mentioned already, um, have a, a lot of benefit. People tend to come out feeling better. I mean, ayahuasca is uh, an antidepressant in, in the acute form it's an MAO inhibitor in it and the old school antidepressant pharmaceutical antidepressants were MAO inhibitors so it has a direct antidepressant effect in the short term Um, and certainly the research that's been done indicates that it's having lasting effects for a significant number of people Um, but I think people can come from all sorts of reasons but that healing aspect is central for many Mm -hmm. you know I was listening to someone quite well known and, and they were they were talking about ayahuasca uh but what they were actually talking about was DMT. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and and the kind of the, the other person was saying, Oh well I I've heard you throw up and the person was like, No, no, you don't throw up. <laughs> you know, it just lasts like fifteen minutes and then it's done. Um but obviously uh, as we know, uh, you know, working with ayahuasca in many traditions, that plant is, is, for example, in Spanish, it's it's often referred to as la purga, the, the purge. Yeah. And and many doctors who work with ayahuasca would say, well, that's actually the main thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so, some would even say, like, the visions, the experience are kind of, you know, an unfortunate side effect that you might have to go <laughs> through in order to experience the purge. So... Yeah. And and that's not just with ayahuasca. I mean, a lot of plants, peyote or mm-hmm. iboga, there, there's very often uh, some form of purge. The, the most common is you know, actual vomiting, but you know, purging can happen in many ways. Yeah. Why do you think with with these kind of sacred plants or, or master plants, there's there seems to be that that commonality of some form of a purge? I don't know, but it's fascinating, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean particularly with ayahuasca because of the way it engages the mind in, in the process and also just because I'm more familiar with it. I mean, I've only done Iboga a few times, um, but certainly compared to peyote, ayahuasca is the, the psychic dimension comes far more um, viscerally engaging. Um, my pet theory, again, you'll notice I'm <laughs> I do then, um, is like somehow, I don't know how, it seems that the medicine, if we just imagine that, you know, there's a certain amount of homeostasis in our cells. We seem to be maintaining things. So that there's a stability to it, which is why we can continue with the same mood patterns for, for long periods of time. It's almost like somehow it creates a circumstance such that that homeostasis is no longer the case and what was sort of allowed to be hidden in there in terms of old energies, old emotions is somehow excreted and exposed to the expelling system. So, mm-hmm. you know, people might... Obviously, the vomiting is the most famous purge, but oftentimes, you know, people go to the toilet, um, or there's the yawning and the sweating and the shaking and the crying and the mucusing and all these things that could go on it's like somehow everything just starts to get expelled. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how, um, but I think this is that, that sort of energetic layer of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, typically in the, in in, in Western psychology, they're not really thinking about the psyche as it relates to body energy, although more so in the somatic type practices, they are for sure. Um, But in sort of, classic Western psychology, psychiatry, not so much, but that's the layer that the medicine seems to really be able to access. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how and why, but obviously there's a, there's a benefit to it. Mm -hmm. I I am not completely dismissive of the psychological aspects of the process either, the visions and the 
you know, because people can even like for example with DMT alone, people experience huge transformations in their personality and their life priorities and all kinds of things as a result of that. Even in the complete absence of the the purging, I personally like the purging. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it can be very unpleasant at the time, but there's definitely a sense that it's really shifting things at really fundamental level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I remember the first time I, I took ayahuasca. Uh, you know, for a long time, I, I, I never felt it was necessary. I, I was kind of under this belief that, you know, we have everything we need within us. And, you know, why why take this thing from the outside? Yeah. Uh, but at some point, I just felt really, really drawn to, to, to work with it. And uh, I think, you know, like three ceremonies went by and I didn't vomit. And, I, you know, it was that kind of that common thing of like, you know, why aren't I vomiting? When is it going to come? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I remember it was probably like the third or fourth ceremony. It was the first time in my life where I vomited and, you know, not much physically came out, but I just had a very visceral kind of known feeling that, that what came out was not physical. There was something, I mean, it was really nasty and it was, <laughs> yeah. it was, and it, it was just such almost a revelatory experience that, this thing was being purged out and I was so happy that it was out, you know, because it was so kind of dark and and potent. And, and I, you know, I felt like this, this thing, this energy was, was released. It was freed. Yeah. And and I think for, (laughs) yeah, for a lot of people, that's really hard to kind of imagine, you know, because usually when we think about purging, it's just, I, I ate some bad food or something and it's coming out. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's it's obviously not something that most people experience directly until they encounter plant medicines. Um, I mean, the one time that, that something similar happened to me, I was working with someone in a non, you know, in, 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 within the National Health Service, actually, so n- no plant medicines involved. Um, they had um, Tourette's syndrome and... So the tics and you know involuntary movements and verbalizations and things, and I was doing as like a focusing process with them, and all of a sudden the guy said, "I'm feeling sick," and I'm like, "Do you need to throw up?" And he said, "Yeah," and I so I quickly went and got a bin for him, and he, mm. he did throw up. So that was really interesting to me to see that happen in a non-medicine mm-hmm. setting, um, but that's relatively rare without medicine, in my experience. But certainly there's you know, yeah. It, it, obviously, it can happen <laughs> because it did happen. <laughs> yeah. So, do you think? I mean, there's this, this work really seems to be growing, expanding. There, there's churches popping up everywhere because legally, often it, it needs to be worked with in a yeah. in a church setting. It's a legal color. Um, mm-hmm. But especially, kind of with the the roots of psychology and that these plants were used, and even you know a lot of uh, indigenous people. The words kind of tricky, but, you know, people who have a long history of working with these plants, uh, like the Shipibo who we work with, you know, some of, one of my favorite maestros, he, he often jokes that they're, they're jungle psychologists, you know, essentially that's what they're doing. I mean, they know an incredible (laughs) amount about the mind. They're not, they don't, they're not necessarily as wordy about it as Western people. You know, they just say, concentrate, (laughs) focus. Yeah. Which is really, if you think about the entire <laughs> mindful tradition and all the mindful practices, that's basically what it comes down to, is learning how to concentrate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, they... So, yeah, I mean, I have, you know, from the bits and pieces I, I picked up from the conversations I've, I've, I've had and, you know, just being around them, they know a lot about mm-hmm. psychology and all these things. They just have a different emphasis because they're working with the plants and so they don't feel like they've got to be the ones to tell you how it works they're like well the plants are going to show you how it works and they have from their own experience the understanding that you can learn directly through your own experience with the plants so that seems to be what they're saying and um yeah the one instruction that master sui said was um said listen and understand it's like <laughs> right I mean it's so profound it's so it's like so simple mm-hmm. but it's just coming from that position of experience and, and you know, like the deep cultural knowledge and, and the deep experience with the plants and the faith that 
that will become cleats people if they just mm. show up and do their best kind of thing, I think. Mm. Yeah. So do you think in, in more Western psychology, this, this is kind of a, a direction that it's moving in? Because it seems like there is, there's, there's a, so much research happening now. There's so yeah. much interest, people coming down, uh, not only to the Amazon, but it's kind of spreading out of the Amazon. And it seems like, yeah. you know, when, when I was in New York, uh, I don't know, eight years ago now, mm. Uh, well, that's when I left. But e- even before then, you know, if I would mention plants as medicine, most people had no idea what I was talking about. Maybe there was some understanding of herbalism or traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like now, you know, going back, there's five ceremonies every weekend in Berlin. Yeah, and, right. Um, so, I mean, it's, yeah. it's really getting out there. So do you think with Western psychology, that's that's really a direction that it's going to start moving in, is, is integrating I, these somehow? I think it's an inevitability, really, just because of the potency of it all. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, you know, if, in terms of, say, the, the, the results they're getting from the research into, you know, psilocybin and, yeah, preliminary results of some of the ayahuasca studies. If there was a pharmaceutical that had those kind of results, people would be pumping, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of money into that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's inevitability just because the proof is in the pudding and people are getting good results out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, there's complicated political processes and cultural processes to go through, um, which will be unfolding in the upcoming years. But mm-hmm. it seems like it's going to go that way. So what do you think is the, you know, it seems like there, there's going to have to be some sort of a happy medium between, you know, taking these plants as they have been worked with for who knows how long, kind mm-hmm. of this idea of tradition, but then also potentially letting some of that go and, and working maybe more in a clinical setting where, yeah. where some of these things aren't done in that way Mm. what do you think that that balance is going to look like i have no idea Mm. um i think it might i don't know actually i really don't know if i was just going to make things up i would say it might depend some in some ways on which substances you're talking about Mm -hmm. um so there's something like psilocybin i could see that very definitely happening with lsd um, MDMA, ketamine, these things will definitely be worked with in a very clinical way. I think that's fine. We've got no major issues with that whatsoever. Ayahuasca seems slightly more complicated to be doing that just because some of the peripheral processes that go on with it that you know we'll, we'll be aware of that it's a little bit hard to describe to people who are uninitiated into that world, but I don't know how you would be dealing with that in the absence of someone who's been working with the medicine themselves for a very long time to really establish themselves in how to, mm-hmm. you know, just like how to clean things up and how to keep the space clean and how to get rid of nasties and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, I'm like, how would you deal with that if you were just like, mm-hmm. you know, in a little office somewhere? I don't know. But yeah, so, and Iboga similarly, I'm sure there are people actually, well, there are people working with Ibogaine, aren't there? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think the, people will be forming different mm. processes in different places. Um, yeah, I mean it's interesting because it, with with uh, working with Spibo, their their main tool is the song. Yeah, the, what they call the ikardo. I mean, for them, that's everything. Mm-hmm. So that's that's how they work. The doctor sings a song. That's that's their main their main medicine. And even when I worked with Iboga, I, I was very taken back uh, by the profundity of the music. I yeah. mean, for me, the music actually put me in a certain state where I kind of saw, uh, you know, because with like Iboga and Ibogaine, there, there's been a lot of research now with with breaking addictions and, and drug addictions and. Um, Obviously, for me, that doesn't seem like that's the point of it, but it seems like that's a side effect. But, yeah. but seeing how the music worked, I could really see, <laughs> yeah, because it was actually putting my mind in this almost like psychotic state of this, this addictive looping, there's no way out, and, and mm-hmm. just kind of forcing one to go in. And so I wonder, 
you know, kind of removing some of those traditional elements. Uh, yeah. Is I mean, the effect the same? I'm sure there'd be some really interesting conversations to be had around <laughs> this, especially if you involved, you know, um, people with an understanding of, you know, how the critiques of like Eurocentric white cultural sort of assumptions about everything. Um, but yeah, I think, I wouldn't be in a huge rush to remove the traditional elements from things um, because they're not random, right? <laughs> they're in there because they're the cultures that have been working with those plants are immersed in them. You know, it's a chicken and egg thing, which one came first, the culture or the medicine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of intelligence in that and two typical Western reductionist ways of thinking where you're like, oh yeah, I'm just interested in the active ingredient, please. The rest of you can just toddle off now. Um, I think it's, that's our sort of presumptuousness and, and our sh shallow kind of, well, maybe it's not shallow, maybe it's just ignorance of, of some of these factors. Um, and, you know, I hear people say things which, um, you know, strike me as naive, especially in the context of working with, you know, within, say, the Shibibo tradition where people say, oh, you don't have to worry about anything bad happening or any darkness because I only work with love and light and therefore <laughs> none of that can touch me. And you're like, whoosh, okay, well, good luck to you, right? But, um, or I've heard people say things like, oh, yeah, those, those indigenous guys, they're stuck in duality. They haven't transcended duality. And you're just like, oh, my God. <laughs> You know, the sort of, it's like a combination of ignorance and arrogance and presumptuousness all wrapped up in one. And yeah, so I'd be really, I don't plan on leaving the just traditions and way of doing things anytime soon. Um, I can understand why people are like setting up clinical type settings for things. And I'm not like profoundly against it. I just worry that, well, naive because I know how much I don't know. You know, like, it's like I've been working with ayahuasca for nearly 10 years now and I still feel like I'm in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So if I was to be like, oh, authoritatively, yeah, let's just step into my office and we're going to set this little thing off and off we go, I wouldn't have a clue what I was doing. But there seem to be people out there who have far less experience than me who seem to be perfectly confident to, like, mm -hmm. take people into their arms and off they go. And I'm just like, well, good luck, but it seems a bit... Full hardy to me, and it's a tricky thing too, right? Because tradition is always changing and and yeah. and adapting and growing and for sure and yeah, but but finding that you know that balance is a very yeah. Very it, tricky it's thing. not about the it's not about the tradition having to be canned. Mm -hmm. It's more just like the understanding woven into it, mm -hmm. and and not being dismissive of some constructs and worldviews that might seem weird to or sort of old fashioned or something like that or whatever you want to say to the sort of more clinical materialistic um, rationales of people typically in the western and scientific backgrounds and things yeah yeah so i mean you probably share a similar experience i, I mean i imagine part of the reason you continue to do this work is by working with people, you see people going through these really profound experiences. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's probably the thing that keeps me going is, you know, after, after having done a workshop as you see 23 people or something sitting around and, you know, almost all of them. And, and again, it's not to, you know, set this expectation that if you yeah. work with this, you are going to have yeah. some profound experience. But having said that from experience, now having worked with really thousands of people, you know, the vast majority of people do have a, a very transformative experience. And, and that can come in, like, like you said, many different ways, you know, what, what someone thinks is going to be transformative, <laughs> you know, at the end, what actually was transformative can be very different. Mm. But I think in retrospect, everyone looking sees, you know, oh, wow, like something really did shift. Mm. Um, so, you know, with that, uh, one, one thing that's really this word integration, but because for, for a long time, you know, it seemed like people came down, they had these transformative experiences, and then they went home. 
And, you know, there wasn't necessarily support. And a lot of people didn't need it. You know, someone has a transformational experience and and they're good to go. You know, they're like, life is great. Everything's great. Uh, But also, as we know, you know, some people can fall into, you know, old patterns. Other things can come up and they they do need support. And I remember having a conversation with, uh, you know, Claude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And... You know, I was kind of thinking about, in a more indigenous context, like, is there integration? And and almost my initial thought was like, that almost seems like a Western concept. But he said it really well. And, you know, and he was like, these guys are, they're, they're, integration is all around them you mm-hmm. know that, that's their whole <laughs> their whole community is just an integrative experience you know anything that comes up they're working through it they're talking to people it's in the family so uh you know i i think that idea of integration is really important and a lot of people you know they 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 come they have this huge experience they're they're in a foreign place a foreign culture all of these things shifts and then they go back to where they were before. Mm. Um, so why why do you think that's become so popular? You know, this word integration and this idea of of actually helping people to integrate their experience after they leave. Yeah, I mean, like you said, in, in, in cultures that have been working with these plants for a long time, that process is, there's a familiarity with the processes surrounding people and their people and resources and the whole world view of the, the culture is makes it an easier and smoother road. Um, and then for people in coming from a Western tradition, for example, and drinking ayahuasca and then going back to a Western tradition, it's not there. So mm-hmm. I guess you could say integration is an attempt to provide that support. And it's just like if you go into a drug and alcohol rehab type process, they'll typically have people who've been through that process before mm-hmm. there to support people. Um, so it's a bit like that in a way. And then we're also adding to that a the application of Western ways of working uh, with the psyche, which, again, if you were to just do it with someone who had no idea of plant medicines, would probably still potentially be quite effective. But if you're working with someone who does have experience with plant medicines, then they're able to weave it all together in a way that helps smooth things out for people. Um, Not to mention that, of course, obviously, we know this, but some people coming to drink plant medicines or work with plant medicines for the first time will be expecting that they're going to feel better afterwards but that's not necessarily immediately the case Mm -hmm. sometimes people have things flushed up that are quite confronting and challenging Um, either you know for example trauma arising or something about the nature of the experience they had was so shocking to them that it takes a while to adjust to the Mm -hmm. new experience Um, and so having some support through that can be really valuable I've heard that you know, people have been in the industry for a while talking about how the initial wave of people coming through was sort of the adventurers mm-hmm. types, uh, or the early adapters, I think they call them. Um, typically the kind of people who aren't really super inclined to ask for help anyway because they like, they're like they very independent-minded and mm. yeah, adventurous. And yeah. Whereas now that it's becoming more sort of established thing, then you're having more... Um, people coming in with different expectations who just appreciate the availability of support Mm -hmm. around things in in a new way. Um, So I guess these kind of factors, plus probably people who were running and facilitating retreats or, for example, supporting Indigenous people in bringing their retreats to, um, to guests from outside their communities and things like that, um, having an influx of people afterwards contacting them with problems they didn't know how to handle Mm. and then looking for people who could support them that's probably also a factor as well because I know that you know the the people I've worked with who are facilitating retreats or working with different aspects of the retreats they like to have someone they can hand guests off to when they're or refer guests to when they're having a difficult time because you know like well, when you've been a facilitator, you, you guys are like on to the next group, for example. And so having someone external who's dedicated to supporting the guests afterwards is really helpful, I think. Mm-hmm. So what? W- that's a big part of your work is, is you do mm-hmm. a lot of uh, 
you know, integrative work, uh, not necessarily in person, but over, over the phone or zoom, things yeah. like that. So what is, what does that look like? Like, why would someone contact you and then how would mm-hmm. you, how would you begin to work with them? So the sort of most basic level of it is people just checking in. Um, so they literally just want to make sure that what's happening to them is normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's so, a huge, that's a huge thing. Right? Yeah. It's just here. Well, yeah, it is in, 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 Western psychology, they call it normalization. Mm-hmm. It means recognizing that what you're experiencing is normal helps you to re- feel less anxious about it, which then, mm-hmm. you know, you start to relax. And that alone, many things just that job done, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> if people accept what they're experiencing. Um, so that's a sort of a first point of call is just checking in about things. Um, we do sometimes like group calls and things for people. And a big part of that is again, the absence of necessarily supportive and understanding community around them. Then they can connect into a supportive group in that kind of way with people who've been through similar experiences. They can talk about things that people roll their eyes about if they talk to them elsewhere. Um, and that can be really supportive for people too. Uh, then there are people for, as I mentioned, the idea that like trauma can be flushed up. So some people, knew they had trauma and were anticipating this and planned it in advance and um, they plan to have appointments arranged when they get home as a part of helping themselves feel safe to do the whole thing. Um, Then there are people who never thought they needed trauma therapy who through the ceremonies realized actually you know what the basically a part of what I saw was that I've got work to do and so I want to take this seriously and so they engage Mm -hmm. for that reason. Um, then there are people who are having these transformative, transpersonal experiences, altered state experiences, and have found that really confronting because it's sort of shaking their worldview. Mm-hmm. Um, so they want some support in grounding that. Uh, and there are people who notice that what they used to be able to tolerate at work and in their relationship and in their family just has become intolerable somehow. It's like they really recognizing uh, what they don't like about their environment and so they want some support in you know figuring out what to do about that um yeah shifts in relationships is a big theme for some people they're probably the main dominant themes mm-hmm. yeah i've had one person ring me up and make sure it's okay to be so happy <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, obviously working with, working with someone who, who has experience with plant medicine, mm. you know, psychology, CBT, that seems super valuable. What are, um, what are, cause it's often a common question people have is, is, you know, outside of that, how, how do I integrate my, my experience? So mm-hmm. are there any, you know, common practices or yeah. things you recommend to people that they kind of help them in that, that practice? Yeah, for sure. A lot of people find um, journaling their experiences to be really valuable. There's something about getting it down on paper um, that seems to help people sort of organize their thoughts, organize their understanding of things, it becomes more coherent to them. Uh, I often recommend some form of uh, dream work to people mm. especially people who mention that there some things are going on in their dreams obviously but it is something to be aware of you know we both know in the Shibibo tradition with the dietas that a significant aspect of the way they work with the plants is by paying attention to their dreams so mm. um, a lot of information can continue to come through dreams for people after their retreats or after their ceremonies um, so specifically the themes of lucid dreaming and out of body experiencing sometimes come up. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the basic level, just dream journaling is a part of it, which doesn't necessarily involve anything unusual about the way in which the dream is happening. But then there's the lucid dreaming, so where people are, you probably know this, just, mm-hmm. where people are aware that they're dreaming while they're dreaming, so that's a lucid dream. Um, and then that seems to become more common with people who've been working with plant medicines. Now, do you think that's something people should like actively be trying to do or just if it, if it arises, I, then all of these things are just, if people are interested, I right. think there's nothing that you have to have to do. 
Um, it's it just gives people options. And I think to feel a sense of agency and to feel confident, people like to have sort of structures so that they can focus on because otherwise we tend to default to wandering around in our mind, which mm-hmm. doesn't always help. <laughs> um, yeah, it's lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiencing. So if relevant or if people are interested r- reading a bit about them because oftentimes you can be reading and you're like, oh, that's exactly what happened to me. And then the normalization, right? Then you start to be like, okay, what I'm ha- what's happening to me is normal. What's happening to me is a recognized experience. There are methods that people have developed for how to work with this and then you know you can really capitalize on it in a way you might not have been able to because if you had to try and figure it all out for yourself um definitely something physical which can be pretty much anything but you know exercise walking in nature um yoga qigong tai chi martial arts sport something Mm -hmm. to just because i mean it, a lot of these things you'll notice they're useful anyway, right? Mm. There's nothing specific about working with plant medicines that means you need to do them more than normal. It's just that sometimes people realize when they are going through a process, they realize even more how valuable those things are, I think, mm. um, because things are moving for them anyway. And so having something that helps kind of digest the energy, super beneficial. Yeah. Um, and grounding, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, to be in the body rather than going off on one in the. <laughs> you started into... jujitsu recently. I, I did. Yeah. And you're there now too. <laughs> <laughs> How uh, how's that been for you? It's great. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to I have done martial arts a long, long time ago, and and yeah, never got super far with it all. Um, so got distracted by other things, but. Um, yeah, I love it. I mean, it's so good to be working with coordination, working with the body and just the, you know, a progressive challenge. It's actually really interesting, like even the, you know, when, when you're getting smashed, right? Like when you, someone's like crushing you, the, the, the breathing experience and the sense of panic that can start to arise when you feel like you can't breathe anymore or you can't escape from the position you're in, um, very relevant to plant medicine space mm-hmm. for those moments when people are confronting something really intense. So I think there's, you know, there's loads of places where there's kind of feedback loops where if you engage in mm-hmm. some kind of practice, even no matter how indirect it seems, it'll benefit you. Um, and yeah, it just gets me out of my head, yeah. which is good. Like I spend a lot of time talking to people and sitting down and things. So yeah, I love it. Yeah. I had a friend who picked up boxing and, uh, he said he, he liked it because it, it dumbed him down. <laughs> exactly, right? I, I mean, the, in, the, in the, another tradition, in the peyote tradition, in the um, Northern American tradition of that, the, the road man I was working with and that said, basically, if you, everything that, you know, like white people or people in the West think, if you turn it completely upside down, you're heading in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so we think, you know, you've got to be super smart and like super intellectual and that's the way that to be the best person is possible in life. And it's like you dumb yourself down, you're actually mm-hmm. doing better. I mean, thinking has its place, of course, but yeah. it's like they say in mindfulness, to don't, don't go to your thoughts for your mm-hmm. sense of self. That's, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. you go to your thoughts if you want to do something... Oh, if you want to do something practical that needs planning, that's what thinking's for, not for, yeah, every yeah, I moment think, of every day kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think martial arts are, they're, they're, they're so, they're so useful. I mean, I, you know, I, I think for everyone, but I think especially for men, especially for young men, I think it's just, oh, it's yeah. a really powerful practice. And I mean, you know, even traditionally, it, it, you know, it's funny, I remember, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, I don't think I was watching the Oscars because I think I, I stopped watching them, but I think I saw a clip and, uh, you know, Meryl Streep came up and she gave this speech about, 
you know, how if we're not all careful, then uh, the, the, the country, the U.S., is going to turn into, you know, just people who, who watch football and do mixed martial arts. <laughs> and then she goes, which we all know are not arts. <laughs> And I was just thinking, like, I mean, the arrogance of that, you know, the, the thinking your art is an art, but someone else's art is yeah, not right. an art. <laughs> and I oh, mean, you know, is. traditionally, you know, it's yeah. fascinating because martial arts were developed, they think, by monks. It was actually yeah, a spiritual right. practice. Wouldn't and, surprise me at all. And, you know, even, even all these uh, ancient... in the physical domain <laughs> and the spiritual domain, right? But even, you know, the, these old kind of Japanese martial arts, I mean, there was always this idea. It wasn't just the art of fighting. It was the art no. of calligraphy, of, of, of how, you, how you garden, how you think, you know, how, yeah. you, how you go through the world. And, and, and it was really and respect and humility. humility yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and really, you know, this idea of, of the martial art itself was a path to enlightenment or oh, yeah. you know understanding that that mm. you know everything could be learned in that and you know i've, I've been really grateful i think to practice jujitsu because i you know so much can be learned in it like you said you know the, the mm. breath the understanding reality you know any kind of ideas you have about like you know well strength isn't real or size doesn't matter you'll learn on day one that's not real <laughs> <laughs> i remember this I remember a very intellectual guy at school once telling me he thought weights didn't make much difference. Right. <laughs> I was just like, yeah. yeah. Just keep telling yourself that. It's like, yeah. You know, things like work ethic. You know, yeah. if mm-hmm. the, the, the guy who trains five five times a week, he's going to be better than the guy who trains three times a week. Yeah. You know, just Respecting it. structure and, yeah. yeah. You know, discipline. I mean, even me, you know, I, I, I've mm. practiced jiu-jitsu for a long time and I just messed up my ankle. And that was jiu-jitsu teaching me, like, don't be a dumbass. Like, you, you're, you're going too fast too soon. And, and it's, yeah. it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's what happens when you do that. And, uh, yeah. So also you, you mentioned, you know, you have, a, you have a, a lot of background in meditation. I mean, that seems like it, that would be a really complementary integrated practice. It, I think it helps a lot. Um, you know, it's, yeah, the... Central to it is the ability to self-regulate by one, you know, voluntarily and intentionally controlling where your attention is. Um, that's very beneficial in the ceremonies themselves too, because that's just, you know, if we sort of functionalize what the maestros say when they're saying concentrate and listen and understand, well, this is, to me, equatable to what mindfulness is, is trying to teach through those practices. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, yeah, a big aspect of it, I think, is the how to get out of your own way. Um, because there's this, you know, idea of you're not your thoughts, you're not your emotions, you're not your body sensation, you are the one experiencing all those things. And also some familiarity with the ben, what I call the benevolence of awareness, that your awareness all by itself knows what to do and knows how to take care of things. And if you get out of the way and let it, it will, and mm-hmm. it will to the extent to which you get out of the way, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is what the practices are all about. Um, so some familiarity with that, some grounding in that, I think can really help because if people get really caught up on a particular thought pattern about what happened to them and how horrible it was or how amazing it was, then they're sort of stuck in their thoughts and, you know, in mindful terms we call it fusion. It's like they're fusing with what they're thinking about rather than being defused from it, which is where you can still think about it, but you're not identified with it in the same way or engaged with it in the same way um, can be, yeah, hugely beneficial. Because a lot of integration takes place all by itself. Um, but that's easier said than done if you're in a traumatized state or if you, something really difficult is happening. And so I find... In fact, a lot of my integration processes with people do utilize mindful meditative processes to help them mm-hmm. get out of the way and also to, it's like the sort of central message of it for me is the security of your own awareness that, that it's always okay, even if you're frightened, even if you're numbed out, even if you're, you know, even if people are dissociated at some level, there's still awareness and the awareness is actually what ultimately can help to 
bring people back. It's like connecting the awareness through the body. Things start to settle. Mm. People come back. So all these things, to me, mindfulness is a good sort of model and structural process to facilitate all that. Mm -hmm. A common question with that, uh, I I think not just in meditation, but but even like in plant ceremonies, Mm. you know, when something is arising, what is, you know, for you, what is kind of the difference between being mindful of something and going into that? Yeah, it's very, it's very, very simple, but it's sometimes a little bit hard to do justice to just with an explanation without some sort of practical process to go along with it but in in some people think mindfulness is about standing back from their experience and being you know the watcher as it's often described and you know there's some sort of distance between you and your experience but this is one of the things the plants actually gave me a metaphor for actually to 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 help describe is that that's only half the picture. So I call that in, in, in this, this metaphor that I don't know if I, I don't actually know where I came across this anyway, but it was definitely within the, I don't know if I thought of it or if someone said it to me or if I, I just I can't even remember, but it, it works. So I, I use it, but um, that that concept of the watcher to me can be considered like the eagle perspective. So that the eagle flies above and looks down at everything below it, but he's not physically affected by anything that it's seeing and so that's sort of like the watch perspective but then the other perspective which is equally as important and in fact fundamental especially to the healing process is the perspective of the snake so the snake always has its belly on the ground and is in intimate connection with the earth below it and in fact doesn't even look up it right Mm -hmm. um so in 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 what I would consider the way I think about mindfulness, both of those things are occurring simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So it's like the perspective of the watcher gives you the security to realize that you are not affected by what is occurring, but the perspective of the snake gives you the the contact, you know, like the real mm-hmm. immersion in the experience. And I think it's the the balance of those two is the sort of the sweet spot that you're looking for. Mm, like great. someone who's really suffering, typically speaking, is really in the um, experience, but doesn't realize that they are also beyond that experience. Mm. Um, and someone who's sort of purely in the watcher, there's that sort of distancing whereby they're not necessarily getting the fluidity and the nuance of the nitty gritty kind of mm. worthy aspects of what's going on. Mm. That's interesting. In a lot of traditions, kind of the, the cardinal directions, the four cardinal directions, two of those are the the eagle or the hawk and, yeah. and the snake. Yeah. You think that's that's part of that? Is there there are Well they know what's going on, don't they? So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing catch up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh if you know, maybe maybe some people haven't done this work before, and they're mm-hmm. they're looking to do it. Mm-hmm. Maybe a lot of people have done this work, but they're looking to to maybe go deeper. Mm-hmm. What are what are what are kind of common things that people should be looking for if they want to do this work? Whether that's in a in a curandero, in a doctor, or a center, mm-hmm. or in, in plants. You know, what kind of from your experience? What are what are things that people should be looking for? As we said earlier, like yeah. to, to do the work well. Yeah. Than... Yeah. So I would say, you know, do your research and be really careful. I mean, you know, like our friend Safa was mentioned this through one of her experiences. She said, look, you, you can't 100% keep people safe. You can't mm-hmm. prevent people from experiencing the bumps of life. And that is certainly the case within plant medicine work. It can be really, really healing, but it can certainly be challenging. And unless you're willing to accept full responsibility that for that for yourself, then best not to begin, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that said, of course, there are ways to do it far more safely and reliably than other ways. Um, and so, yeah, do your research. I say if, you, if there's a way to speak to the people offering things, if you're going to be doing it under someone's care or with someone, then ask them, what their experience is, what training they've had, what tradition they're in. Um, I'm a bit conservative on that front in that I still have a preference for tradition rather than 
there's loads of people out there who are like, oh no, I'm, you know, I just like channel the energy and um, you're all good with me and don't worry about them because I know how to do all that stuff. And, you know, I, I'm, I have my biases in that through my experiences. Um, so I definitely prefer the traditional approaches at this point, uh, especially for things like ayahuasca and iboga for sure, you know. Um, and if you can, if there's a possibility of talking to people who've been through that center or that place or with those people before, check them out if you can mm -hmm. and see are they grounded? Are they all a bit fruit loopy and lost in some sort of spiritual fantasy now or something like that? Then not a good sign. Um, yeah, so people but who that, are... That's a big deal too, right? Like that's often... A, I think that's a really important factor. Yeah. yeah. Like a lot of times I think in the spirit, you know, spiritual work, the idea of groundedness yeah. is often lost. <laughs> totally. Because a lot of these people seem to end up... It's like, the again, these traps are... All of these things are like, they've been observed before and they're mapped out in traditions. Unfortunately, the people who seem to go that way tend to be anti-tradition, mm -hmm. right? Which is exactly what I'm kind of alluding to with all this, that it's like, you know, the rooted traditions have lasted the distance because they know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then I think it's this thing process whereby people say, I'm spiritual now. Therefore, I'm advanced in some way compared to others. Therefore, I don't need to care what they think or do anymore. Mm -hmm. Which is just a spiritual trap. And the irony of it, anyway, to me. Mm -hmm. um, that, you, you know, you should be able to relate to people better. <laughs> you should be able to, like, interact in the world m more effectively. Otherwise, it's quite possible you go in the wrong way. <laughs> Unless you're planning on becoming like a monk or and you know like an ascetic kind of person who literally has made that very very like rare decision to truly separate from society and solely focus on mm -hmm. you know that path which is even that tends to occur within a tradition doesn't it mm -hmm. um and, and that also seems to me one of the really important things of of actually having a teacher or, you know, working with a, a, a doctor, whatever you want to call it, yeah. is someone to be able to regulate that. Yeah. Because it's also interesting, something, you know, I've heard a lot, it, you know, there is this truth that the plants, you know, for example, are teaching you everything, you know, mm -hmm. that's where the knowledge is coming from. Yeah. But the plants just don't miraculously pop up and go into your body either, right? Yeah. There's, there's a process that they have to get there. They, there's yeah. a knowledge. Of How did which you even plants. know to take them in the first exactly, place, yeah. right? But, and and I yeah. think that's where the doctor is very important to be able to regulate that. And, totally. Yeah. You know, it's it's something, you know, probably you've seen and I've seen is, you know, a lot of people can do this work for a long time and yet somehow just seemingly maintain the same space, you know, lost in the same illusion. And, yeah. and you know, that's where I think sometimes like, a, a again, a good doctor is important, you know. If, if the ego is getting too inflated... Give them a big cock. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that will humble exactly. you very quickly. And yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be freestyling in this world. I, I don't, I mean, the, the, there are so many people out there who appear to be doing various forms of that. And I'm just like, but okay. I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, each to their own, but I definitely have my preferences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, um, you know, there, there are a number of these plants, things like ayahuasca, iboga, peyote. Uh, do you think it's just something personal that, that, that someone feels called to one or there's certain ones you would recommend for certain things? I was asked this question in another context as well. And, and, um, someone who's like trying to set up a system of recommendations for that. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to be making that decision for other people, honestly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean... But do you think they're all like essentially getting at the same thing? They're just different different mediums to get there. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, I can speculate about some of that stuff and say, oh, well, you know, mushrooms usually seems a little bit more easygoing for people than ayahuasca, and maybe it's a bit better for depression, whereas ayahuasca seems to be 
have more sort of, especially within a, you know, like a broad ranging mm. tradition with many other plants alongside, like with, with the spiritual tradition, maybe for like other forms of physical healing, it's capable of going a bit deeper and all this stuff. But it's like, to, it, this, I think there's so much knowledge within any of those traditions on their own that for me to just sit here and say, oh yeah, I can tell you about this, that and the other, it's like, I can't. You know, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked most with ayahuasca a decent amount with, with uh, peyote, but, and, you know, like, it, when I'm being flippant, I'll say, yeah, for me, peyote is good luck, right? But, like, I have my own sort of sense of what that means to me through my own experiences, but how would I translate that to somebody else about what that kind of process and tradition is going to mm. offer them? And certainly the, you know, when I've worked within some peyote ceremonies they're more uh, explicitly healing oriented at certain points um, but the focus in terms of the way I've seen those ceremonies isn't so overtly about healing as many western people approach ayahuasca if that makes sense mm. it's more like a kind of community process um, mm. going on which has healing elements but it's not just about the healing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, how to compare and contrast all these things, I've got no idea. It's like you say when you're talking about uh, Iboga, it's observable that it seems to be beneficial for um, addiction and things like that. But to say that's what Iboga is about would be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, it's its own mm -hmm. tradition, which I know very little about, but mm -hmm. I know enough about it to know that it's an amazing plant. Mm. Mm. So each of each of these plants or each of these kind of systems, you, would you say they're they are a system in and of themselves? Like they are a kind of a path or a, a well, way. Well, the cultures that they that they've the cultures surrounding them have mm. the paths within them too. And I mean, so I suppose you know even within ayahuasca, like I know am most familiar with the ideas and practices of the Shipibo tradition, even though I'm only in kindergarten in that context, then there's loads of other traditions working with it in a different way. But, you know, definitely there's healing involved, but there's so much more than, you know, it becomes a world unto itself, really, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this in, in the traditions and practices you're working with. It's You're getting healing, but you're getting a lot more than that. I mean, I think a lot of people end up at a certain point realizing you're getting a lot more than you bargained for. Mm -hmm. And certainly within my experience there, these, and, and I've heard that this is definitely a part of the path, that you get these little moments of like, are you sure you want to do this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because this is not fucking about, right? And then you get this sudden like, oh my God. And then you're like, okay, yes I do. And then you can mm -hmm. kind of progress and everything, you know, continues. But it's like, you're, Find, I find myself that you, I can see the level of commitment involved in the ongoing path and that it's a lot more than just about me and my priorities, although obviously it's fulfilling and enjoyable in ways that keep me going, right? So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big theme that you hear a lot with with those plants is that they're constantly giving you tests yeah and and you know a lot of people at a certain test at a certain level they say okay that's, that's oh, right. it. okay that's, you know it's enough. yeah i can imagine that could happen <laughs> yeah so far i've always sort of had just like a okay 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 breathe <laughs> go back to basics it's okay <laughs> and then come through but yeah yeah it's like the Having to let, having to give up your assumptions, yeah, you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, one thing, uh, you know, in in many traditions, it, it seems like whether it's through plant work or meditation, it, there seems to be this kind of archetypical idea that that these these practices are somehow leading us towards unity. Yeah. Uh, you know, towards a, a lack of division. You, you mentioned like the sense of self, that that's where a lot of the problems come from, you know, mm -hmm. like my thought, my this, da da da. da. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, we seem to be living in an interesting time where it seems, you know, maybe it's just because of media, but it seems like there's a lot of division right now. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you what do you think about that? I mean, is is that just like kind of a natural pendulum that life goes through, or you know, some sort of collective unconsciousness, <laughs> or uh, you know, are plants yeah. a remedy to that? Uh, do you think they 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 offer some sort of solution, or I that just no it's way idea. out of control? I have no <laughs> idea. I mean, I, I know people talk about things like the Great Awakening and we're going to elevate to the fifth dimension and everything's going to be hunky-dory and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I mean, if that were the case, why is there so much fighting in the jungle? Uh-huh. You know? Um, so, I have no idea, honestly. I mean, it, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, I saw in my um, ex-girlfriend's dad's bookshelf this thing of like, I can't remember the name of the title, but it was basically a thesis that war leads to peace. <laughs> <laughs> and it was talking about how big big wars lead to big peace. And, uh, you know, um, so I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, um, so you're not of the mindset yeah. that, that COVID is like uh, humanity's natural cleansing and it's going to lead to the great rebirth. How the hell would I know that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I know that, well, I've... I, uh, I know I've been told, like, you know, Felix talking to to some of the maestros there and, and like, and, and what they see and, um, and they see it as, like, just kind of, like, fear invoking kind of big black magic things spiraling through the world kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure they don't see it as a government conspiracy, just for the record. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know. Like, how the hell can I know the answers to these kind of questions? Like, like I'm, you know, there's a camera on. Like, socially, I, I, I can, like, speculate. But then at a certain point, I realize I have no idea. Like, I'm just talking nonsense, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. It would be nice if, if, if everyone could get on. Yeah. <laughs> but who knows yeah. what's really going to happen. Well, I've got a I've got a couple of questions uh, from uh, some of the the Patreon subscribers. Um, oh yeah, you mind if I uh, ask you those? Is there anything else you wanted to to talk about or or address? Mm. No, I'm. I'm uh, the way you're flowing, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> good All interviewer. Right. Yeah. So, um, so these are a few questions. Okay. Um, this one is. Uh, he says, "Is there a danger in using ayahuasca or other other plant medicines like that?" Uh, and and I guess this question is in this idea of like escapism. So, you oh, know, yeah. is is there something where people are just using these to escape? actually yeah. maybe the problems or reality yeah. and and the follow-up with that is uh when is the right time to use them and when you sh- when should you just actually try and focus on like the real world what's actually going on yeah that's a great question really i would say um yes there are potential dangers to working with ayahuasca um as we've already been talking about i think you know to do it in a safe setting and to do it carefully um, and in a grounded way is, is, you know, you can't underestimate the importance of it. I mean, people get away with doing all kinds of mm-hmm. crazy stuff out there, but in terms of the risks involved, I think if people really, really, really knew what they were doing, they would not do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in terms of when to do it, I think it's when you have the time, space and resources to be able to go through the process, potentially come back from it and have ongoing work to do. And, and, and that's actually available to you. Mm -hmm. Um, that's worth considering. And again, you know, I'm being a total hypocrite because I have done it where I drank ayahuasca six times in a row and then went back to work the very next day. It was not an easy day at work. That's for sure. Um, but you know, I did get through it. And that's the thing, like I'm sort of talking about ideal scenarios, 
that a lot of people get away with far less than this. So, so this would be sort of, if possible, look at it this way. Mm -hmm. um, when should people deal with the real world? Pretty well, all the time, <laughs> if possible. Yeah. If I think if anyone thinks that ayahuasca is going to help them escape from anything, it's a very poor way of doing that. <laughs> it's um, it's not fun in any sort of typical sense of the word. Um, and I think the measure of that might be something like if you're able to do everything you need to do in practical terms, whether that's like looking after your family or going to work or going to school or whatever it is you're doing, meeting all your requirements and you're able to eat well and you're able to sleep well and you're able to be present for other people, including normal people, um, that's a good indicator mm. that you're doing okay. Um, and so if you're using it to sort of like get away from all that, then that's maybe not the best thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how's that sound to you, Jason? Yeah. I mean, so, so maybe, maybe like using it like as a tool, yeah, not exactly. as something that's, that's necessarily magically going to fix my life, but this is something no. I'm doing with a very concerted effort to try and remedy something. Yeah. And, and if you're willing to work, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're willing to make changes and do things and put in effort and face things, um, mm -hmm. that's going to make it go a lot more smoothly. Yeah. And that's important too, right? I mean, kind of like, like anything, like jujitsu, it, it doesn't come for free. It, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. And definitely, I think with this work, you know, from what I've seen, that it, it, like anything, you know, the, the people who put in the work are going to get more out of it. And okay. if you just show up and you're like, oh, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's kind of what you get out of it. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, what is the end goal in all of the work? That's in quotation. What is the end goal of all of the work we do with plants and things like meditation? To be present, to be happy, appreciative of life, to be kind for self-exploration. So yeah, yeah I guess the, the point is like, why, oh, why do all of this? Well, they just said it, didn't they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's various ways of looking at this. I, um, heard, I listened to this talk by Uma Thurman's dad, mm. who I respect because he's Uma Thurman's, she's, he's, he's Uma <laughs> Thurman's dad. And he was saying that like people come to, for example, Buddhism, um, oftentimes we're thinking about it in terms of, oh, I'm going to be enlightened and I'm going to sit in this heavenly cloud of bliss forever and ever. But actually that's not really what it's about. It's about understanding what's going on in your psyche and, and, and how the mind works. And our consciousness works so that you can be wise and un understanding and have compassion in your relationships with other people. And it's like, oh yeah, so it's a much more sort of down to earth thing in the end than, than what a lot of people think we're like escaping from something. No, it's like you're just yeah. actually just trying to be functional. And, and obviously, within, I think within the plant medicine traditions, there are you know these kind of initiations into if you if you keep going where you're essentially cultivating certain qualities that, um, you know, like of strength, of resilience, of insight, sometimes of particular skill sets relevant to the plants themselves, potentially, for example, healing processes, uh, things like that, or, you know, things that are relevant to the cultures, like mm -hmm. uh, how to relate to the culture, how to uphold the traditions and, the prayers of the, the, those cultures, I think, are sort of working in those directions as well. But all of them are about harmony with the community, harmony with the world, mm -hmm. you know, knowing our place on earth and in, in relationship to the animals and plants and spirits and mm -hmm. everything. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of self-knowledge and knowledge of the world in that. I don't know if it ever ends. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's an end goal. Um, other than to just kind of keep on top of that in a way, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, obviously there are, you know, these perspectives on kind of expansions of consciousness. I sort of don't like to get too preoccupied with them. 
Um, I don't know that much about them, to be honest. Like, obviously, I come across them in, in, in meditative processes and in uh, medicine work, but they all come and go, so... Um, what was I going to say? can't remember. I interviewed uh, Leela. You, you worked with her, yeah? Yeah. And uh, I interviewed her, I guess it was the last podcast. And, uh, Cushy Leela. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think she says it, you know, really well and just really simply. She says, you know, the, the, the goal of this work is to to laugh like we laugh and so you can be happy. There you go. You know? so, <laughs> <laughs> but it does seem, you know, like there's a lot of resistance. I mean, even I've talked to people who, who do this work and when that answer is presented, you know, like the goal of this work is simply to be happy. Mm. There's a lot of resistance to that. Yeah. Do you think that also kind of comes from maybe that more kind of, you know, Western intellectual mind of like, well, it can't just be that simple, you know, can't we need to have purpose and, you know, all How of many these degrees things. do you need to be happy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think so. I mean, it's like the, we're just chasing our own tail half the time, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, what I, I mean... I came up with a goal when I was much younger that I want to die laughing. Mm. So there's something to it. You know, I didn't pick that up out of any... No one told me about that. I just I just love laughing and I figured, well, that's how I want to go out, right? So, mm. like, um, it makes sense to me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> uh, and then the last one, um, I know that... Uh, the diet is a complicated and sometimes frustrating topic. What is your personal take on diet? Vegan, paleo, uh, what brings us closest to our spiritual self? That's actually a really common question. Uh, right. Because often, yeah. you know, in this work, uh, there's a lot of beliefs around diet. Yeah. You know, and everyone has their own belief of what's totally. the best way. And, you know, yeah. if you don't do this... But even, you know, the working... Pineapples. Right. <laughs> but I mean, even with... I mean, I guess I was referring that more to kind of like the outside experience of people who come in and, you know, oh, like, right. you have to be vegan, you have to be vegetarian, yeah. or you, you have to eat meat. But then yeah. even with, you know, the, the idea of a lot of this plant work, there's dietary things that are actually very important, things you have to resist or... Yeah. Um, but I, I think what, what they're asking more is, is more, you know, is there some diet that's, that's more correlated to this path of, you know, working with plants or spirituality? Uh, and I think um, it depends totally on traditions. Uh, certainly most indigenous people are not vegan yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or vegetarian. <laughs> um, but then in, you know, some uh, meditative traditions, they are mm-hmm. vegetarian. Um, but, uh, you know, like obviously within particularly ayahuasca work because of the MAU inhibitor and also the, you know, the way that some of the plants work, then there are more restrictive diets, especially at certain times. Um, but they are not necessarily just because those are like spiritual diets but because it's about what's needed to work mm-hmm. as effectively as possible with the plants and so it's like periodic mm-hmm. obviously there seems to be a big no-no around pork um, within ayahuasca traditions within what I've seen of the uh, peyote traditions nowhere near as strict or concerned about all of that mm-hmm. um, Iboga wasn't so strict was it? It's not as strict, yeah. 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 Um, I think because you're so, just yeah. so out there, it doesn't matter what you eat. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so as for a particular diet being more spiritual than another, it doesn't entirely make sense to me um, because that would somehow imply that indigenous people aren't spiritual if the spiritual diet is veganism. Mm. Um, obviously, that's nonsense. So, um, yeah, I would say people have to find their own way with that and I'm not going to tell them what to do. 
Yeah, it, it's interesting because going back to the, the interview with Leela, uh, you know, she was saying how in, in the Shpibo tradition, there, there was the, the three primordial curanderos. There was the Onaya, mm-hmm. the Yobu, mm-hmm. and the Moraya. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, each of those has a certain power, but the, the Moraya was considered the, the highest. The highest. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of Shpibo say there are no more Mordaya now, and, and that's what Lila was saying, and she said a big reason of that. I mean, you know, one is people don't necessarily want to do that work. Yeah, um, I mean, that must be hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that also, she was actually saying diet, you know, that, oh, yeah. that, that, you know, nowadays people eat whatever, they eat potato chips and junk food, and she was saying oh, in, right. yeah. in the ancestr- ancestral times they ate, like, fresh fish and, you know, like just plantain and like all of the food oh, was yeah. natural and that actually right. that well, allowed yeah, that them to be, be more connected well there you go Lita's already answered the question mm-hmm. but that would be yeah I wasn't even thinking in terms of like potato chips and KFC or whatever like um, yeah. yeah I was thinking I sort of was taking that as a given mm-hmm. um, <laughs> potato chips is not the path to enlightenment yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> But it is a complicated thing, too, because, uh, I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, probably seven years ago when I started this work, uh, you know, like, like at the temple where we've worked, uh, there, there's always a, a consultation where people come yeah. one-on-one and they talk to you about their, their ailments and, uh, and specifically physical ailments. Like, what are they dealing with physically? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would say probably seven, ten years ago, things like digestive issues it was maybe like i'm just kind of making this number up but maybe like 10 percent of the people would have that okay and more recently i'd say in the last year or two i'd say it's probably 50 or more percent of people have Mm. digestive issues so i think there is something that's that's a bit out of balance i would imagine with people's diets and i don't know if it is you know, people are eating more processed foods or genetically modified foods or the soil yeah, is right. being depleted or it's it's more of a psychological thing where, you know, that's just causing digestive unrest. But Yeah, um, yeah that's an interesting um, thing, observation, if that's the statistics of what's happening. I don't know much about that really at all, but, yeah. Um, I heard one person say, I think they were, yeah, I think they were talking in terms of general health in a very sort of generic way, that it doesn't matter what you eat so much as who cooked it. Mm-hmm. If you cooked it yourself, then you're probably going to be good. Mm-hmm. If you're like eating out or eating processed foods or eating, then that's not so good because mm-hmm. it tends to be more fat, more sugar, more salt, more yeah. this than the other. Well, there's also the, the interesting... Uh, phrase in the Bible, I, I think Jesus says something like, "It's, it's not what you put in your mouth that counts; it's what comes out of your mouth that counts." <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't remember that. Bit, but <laughs> I mean, I, I might not, I might not have said it completely right. But this idea that you know, we often get so focused on like, what am I taking in? What am I taking in? Yeah. And we forget, like, well, what, what am I, am I giving out? out? You know, what am I putting out That's there? And, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, we're we're pretty close to two hours. Is there anything else you wanna you wanna touch on? No, just to say it's been a pleasure to talk and yeah, you know, good interview, Jason. So, <laughs> well, if if people are interested in uh, in contacting you, how how would they get in contact with you? Uh, best uh, way would be through my website, which mm-hmm. is just my name dot com, so seanchitty dot com. Um, you want me to spell it, or are you gonna? Yeah, I can put it in the the show notes at the end. And, okay, cool. Yeah. 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 Spelt the Irish way. Yeah, <laughs> and it, you're you're working also at Soltara now, right? The, yeah, the Ayahuasca right. Center. Yeah, so I do the integration support for Soltara. Okay. Um. So yeah, I'm working with the guests from there, but also people come to me from, you know, various places. Mm-hmm. Some of the people I'm working with are not working with plant medicines at all. It's not mm-hmm. the only thing I'm doing, but obviously it's a big part of it. Yeah. And are you, are you doing like similar retreats at Soltara where you're, you're running groups? We're, we were planning to, to right. do the mindfulness <laughs> and the medicine retreat, but that's obviously been postponed because of COVID. Um, so I, well, yeah, I'm sure we'll be doing that again as and when we can. Yeah. 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 Great, man. Well, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll do another one. Uh, That'd be awesome. Yeah. Before, before we'll have to come up with some other topic, but, uh, I'm sure there's plenty. Awesome. Thanks very much, Jason. Cheers, man. It was a pleasure. Good to talk to you. Thanks for the opportunity.
Yeah, it's been great. All right, everybody. So that's it. Uh, that was Sean. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the show and, uh, and, and learned something new. Um, like I said, I think he's a really good ambassador and he does really good work. Uh, if you want more information about Sean, uh, you can find him at Soltara. You can find him on his website uh, if you're interested in working with him. Um, I'll put all those, uh, all those links at the, uh, in the show notes. Uh, so that's it. Um, the next episode I'm going to be doing with, uh, another gentleman who lives and works around here. I actually don't know him so well, uh, but he's been recommended to me by, by many people who I know, friends, colleagues, and they say he does amazing work. Um, and he actually works with Wachuma or San Pedro, uh, which is a plant I actually don't know that much about. Uh, I've, I've, I'm familiar with it. I've, I've worked with a lot of people who've worked with it, but I actually uh, don't have a lot of experience with it myself. So it'll be a really interesting podcast for me to, to, to hear his perspective. So uh, that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed. Um, uh, like I said in the beginning, if you can hit the subscribe button, that really helps. Um, and if you're able to donate anything, uh, that makes a really big deal. Just helping to continue to produce this show. Um, Patreon is a really good way. Uh, you can donate as little as $1 a month and every little bit really helps to keep the show running. Um, and you get added benefits like, uh, early access to shows, Q and A's, bonus material. Uh, so it's a, it's a really nice way to give back and also receive something. Um, and to those of you who are subscribing, who have been, uh, uh, donating in that way. I really appreciate it. Uh, it does make a big deal. So thank you guys. Um, that's it. I'll see you in the next episode. Thank mm-hmm. you.